these type of efforts have never been as important, right? And so that's why I think this upcoming conversation is so, so um, crucial in this moment. It is titled um, Women Defending the Vote. And it's going to be moderated by Dr. Angie Maxwell. And she is the director of the Diane Blair Center of Southern Politics and Society at the University of Arkansas. And she'll be joined by some incredible panelists today. We have Kimberly Tihi. She is the Cherokee Nation's delegate to the U.S. Congress. We have Fatima Go Fatima Angos Graves, President and CEO of the National Women's Law Center, and Maria Teresa Kumar, she's the founder of Voto Latino. So let's give them an applause. Well, the ladies on this stage have done so much to help register women to vote, to turn out the vote. And since we're all here to learn how to do more and better, because we are only gonna save ourselves. We wanna hear from these experts. So I'm gonna start with a general question for each of them to answer, and then we'll go into some specifics about their expertise. Um, so I first wanna ask all of you, how do we build a broad coalition of women that will not only vote, but participate in politics outside of just the month before an election? What have you seen? What have you seen work? What advice do you have? We'll start with you, uh, Maria Teresa Kumar. Of course, first of all, thank you so much for, uh, for including us in this conversation. It is an incredible honor because it has been because of Secretary Clinton that I think so many of our groups have been able to advance. She is an individual that uh, said, this is what leadership looks like. I didn't win the election, but I'm gonna make sure that I'm breaking ceilings to ensure that our democracy is secure. Secretary Clinton, thank you so much for your leadership and your support. And when you ask what does coalition of women look like, you are the example. And one of the reasons that Voto Latino has been able to move and grow in the last election in 2020, we registered 650,000 people despite a pandemic. 60% of them were women and 58% of them were first time voters. So when people say that young people and women are not paying attention, we're angry. I like to say we're pissed with purpose. <laughs> But it was the coalition of not just your traditional grassroots organizers that did it, but it was influencers stepping up. It was companies stepping up. We did partnerships with Nike, with Steve Madden. We did partnerships as well with local influencers that had a following as small as 3,000 people in El Paso, but they influenced someone else. And it's when you, sometimes, you know, people say, well, what can I do? And I say, what's your superpower? Because our strength in democracy and in our government is recognizing the talents that each of us hold, and that's what we lean into. Because that is how we actually safeguard democracy, and I think we're going to continue seeing more businesses, more individuals coming in and saying, this is our fight. Fatima, you wanna? Yeah, I think I should probably pick up where you left off, because what Secretary Clinton has done is gathered us, and that is one of the things that we have to do in these times, gathering and gather often. And I believe we're a little bit harsh on ourselves sometimes as women about our ability to form coalitions. What I've seen over the last five years, um, and it may be in different names, but it is women out of rage, anger, purpose, and energy showing up. So sometimes that looked like the Women's March. Sometimes that looked like people gathering around Me Too. Sometimes it looked like the identity of motherhood and caregivers during this pandemic. And so part of our challenge right now is to understand that these aren't individual fights that have nothing to do with each other, that this is really one fight that we are having about whether or not we get to be fully equal in this country and what it will take. And I think we can start to knit it together a little bit if we're actually working on some single things. That's, that's why elections sometimes are so helpful because it's a single action and you can come together and you can join together despite your differences but it's it can feel to people like not enough time to build the long-term trust to make it durable and resilient so my offering is that across identity 
even when it is hard, we come together, even if you think it's not your fight. So whether it is the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act that has just the last few weeks of this year to pass, or whether it is joining in in support of gun safety, that if we join together across the individual thing that drives you, that gives us an opportunity to practice that trust and that work together. Thank you. I was mentored by the former and late principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, Wilma Man Killer. And thank you. <laughs> I was fortunate to be her intern. And being her intern meant that I was able to observe, often go with her to meetings and see her engage at the highest level. You know, we hear about her greatness, right? But she's the first one to go and seek help, to seek assistance, to build coalitions, different communities of color, different women to lift her up, but to also help her, lift herself up. And so one of the things that I think has been very important for me is the feeling the responsibility to mentor others and to also ask for help. And if you fail, because it's gonna happen, if you make mistakes, it's gonna happen. It's not the fact that you fail that's gonna you know, be a judgment on you. It's how you pull yourself back up. That's gonna be a measure of how you succeed. There's so many coalitions out there now and leaders now who are willing to look to the next generation of leaders, the next young people to um, help, help you know, the future generations be successful as well. So I, you know, I follow that path and ditto what my co-panelists have said as well. Thank you. Um, my next questions are for you, Maria. Um, you founded Voto Latino in 2004. What does it look like 18 years later after this election cycle? Well, first of all, there's many of folks who were there from the very beginning. Uh, so they knew that it was a piece of paper with uh, this idea that if we spoke to young people in English, using technology, and giving them agency and recognizing the agency that they already had, that they could create a revolution. And the reason we founded it in 2004 was that we learned that in 2003, Latinos became the second largest demographic of Americans. But most of them were under the age of 18. Our calculations were that Latinos were going to become the second largest voting bloc in 2024 when in fact they became in 2018. We focused our efforts first in Colorado. We helped flip that state. Then we went to North Carolina. We're working on that. <laughs> then we went and focused for the last 12 years, Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Texas, and Florida. And we'll park Florida over there. <laughs> But I think we can lay to rest this, this election that Latinos are firmly progressive individuals who deeply care about our democracy. There are 6.5 million Latinas who live in states that have banned abortions. Latinas are the largest group of women of color impacted by abortion and having banned them. As a result, we have you, the majority of Latina women, a full third of them, already have children in these states and they cannot have agency over their body. And that's why they came out, they showed up, despite the headlines, because they recognize that they are the ones that are the breadwinners and they're the ones that are navigating the country for so many communities. And this is just a fun fact. If you were to have put a plot graph behind me and show where the majority of Americans lie demographically, the majority of white Americans are 58 years old. The majority of African Americans, again, the plot graph, are roughly 50, uh, 43 years old. Can you tell me, anyone guess, what that plot graph is for the Latino community? Just one, give me one number, someone shut it out. Your closest. 11 years old. We are, if you were to go to the, some high schools here in Arkansas, you'd be amazed that in some high schools, they're half of the population. Our country's not ready. 
And we have to make sure that these young people have the agency to defend their families when the fight comes to them. It was a long game. You're playing a long game. Fatima, I wanted to ask you as president and CEO of the National Women's Law Center, this is the thing I worry about when I can't sleep at night. Talk to me about why the judiciary is so important to the vote. Yeah, I, I'm worried too. And what I will tell you is that um, we are not alone in our worry. And I, I think in this moment, people recognize that our judiciary and the rule of law is a fundamental pillar in our democracy that it is that it is in jeopardy and the majority of voters when you sort of look at what they were had in their minds as they were coming to the polls in this election democracy was at the top along with inflation and along with abortion, our very democracy is at the top. And some of that is the understanding of deep voter suppression and gerrymandering and the way that we've been able to live in a country that is minority rule. But a lot of that is the confidence in our Supreme Court. And for this country, that is really scary, to be in a situation where both because of the Dobbs decision and some other decisions where 50 years of precedent was so cavalierly thrown out. And if you think about 50 years, we're a young country. 50 years is a long time in this, in this young nation. So it's unsettling. And the chaos that came from it uh, was totally predictable, both the legal chaos and the public health crisis. But the other piece of it in terms of confidence in the court is not just the decision, it's the process by which uh, justices have been selected. It's things like the reporting out of the New York Times around the Hobby Lobby decision and the draft leaked opinions. Strong democracies can count on fundamentally clear uh, understandings around our rule of law. And so, in this moment, the thing that gives me hope is that the public recognizes it. The public recognizes that our fight for reproductive freedom, which is for sure fundamentally tied up in our ability to be equal in this country, is also around our fight for a strong democracy. And to your earlier question, that's in part how you build stronger and durable coalitions around this. It is not an isolated fight anymore. Thank you. So the Honorable Kim Teehee, we know that you know voter registration among Native Americans is increasing, um, but still has a long way to go. Can you talk to us about what some of the obstacles are in that community and what, how it's being addressed? Sure. I wanna take a step back though, because yesterday when I was going through the exhibit and, watch, and, and looking at the panels and the timeline, uh, it was so impressive and so many champions um, of the vote. And I think back at, at Cherokee Nation's history, we are traditionally a matrilineal society. You know, prior to colonization, it would be unfathomable for women to not be treated equally in our society. And I'm also mindful of the Haudenosaunee women who assisted um, the suffragist movement. You know, they maintained their own identity. They had control of their own beings, their body, their, their, um, their political views. They were decision makers in their community. They were property holders in their community. And that was something. And so native suffragists also helped with the vote. And when it happened in 1920, guess what? Native women were not allowed to vote because Native women were not considered citizens yet. That didn't happen until Congress enacted the uh, Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. And, and then, you know, the other things occurred, of course, you know, disenfranchisement of those votes occurred and such. And so there are still challenges. And some of those challenges are lack of access to polling places. You know, because of federal policies, Indian tribes often live in the most remote, remote rural areas of this country and have to drive great distances in order to vote. 
uh, also voter IDs. You know, a lot of tribes have uh, citizenship cards, but guess what? Those citizenship cards that a lot of people rely on as their sole ID are not acceptable when they want to go vote. Um, but in addition to that, because of the rural nature of where we live, you know, we don't have physical addresses oftentimes. We have PO boxes, rural routes, and those pose a great impediment to how we vote as well. But also infrastructure having lack of connectivity um, in those rural remote communities means that's also a way that, that often our citizens are shut out of information. Uh, in the 2022 midterm elections, the First Nations Development Institute, along with the African American Research Collaborative, found that 42% of native voters uh, were contacted by candidates and organizations. That means 58% of Native voters in the 22 midterm elections were not contacted at all. And that's shocking. What it also found is that half, about half of Native voters in this country still feel underrepresented. So what can we do about that? Well, there's several things that we can do. One is greater investment in voter turnout. Um, making sure that Indian issues are part of candidate and party platforms. Uh, making sure that there is native representation when it comes to task force, task forces and committees that are set up to make decisions about voting in this country. Uh, making sure that PO boxes are permissible, that tribal IDs are permissible, that there's native languages that can be translated, that can translate the information because we still have first language speakers. My parents, I'm blessed to still have them, are Cherokee Nation first language speakers. And they, my mom was a pollster and was asked one time to, um, to assist somebody who preferred to, you know, understand what was going on in the Cherokee language. And she couldn't do that because the people around her didn't know what she was going to say. They didn't want her to influence the vote and such. Um, so that was unfortunate. But in addition to that, other things that can happen is uh, making sure that uh, we mentor and recruit and support Native candidates for local and state and, and federal races. Um, and I think most importantly too, is that we pass the Native American Voting Rights Act that's pending in Congress right now, uh, because that would go a long way in addressing a lot of these challenges that I just mentioned. Thank you. I have a follow-up for you. I wanted to know, you know, Congress is on the verge of seating you as a non-voting, delegate representing the Cherokee Nation. Why is this so important? So for those of you who are not familiar with our history, you probably have heard of the Trail of Tears, right? I think this property sits on one of the roots of the Trail of Tears. The Trail of Tears stem from an 1835 treaty, our removal treaty, when we gave up 7 million acres of land in the East and by an illegal faction of Cherokees. But that treaty was signed and ratified by the Senate, and it was signed by the President of the United States, and it is considered the supreme law of the land today. Included in that treaty is language that is written as a mandate. It says it is stipulated that Cherokee Nation shall be entitled to a delegate in the House of Representatives whenever Congress makes provision for the same. And people often ask why we uh, wait it so long to exercise that right. Well, if you consider how federal law and policy treated Native Americans over the course of the 19th century into the 20th century, it took years to rebuild a nation. Chief Mankiller was a large part of that rebuilding. And I mentioned her earlier. Um, so, so we are at the place where we had to educate about our treaty, had to, had to educate about, about the Trail of Tears, because we're not taught these things in public school systems for the most part, right? And so we had to educate members of Congress about this and their staff and committees. And the pandemic, you know, proved to be an impediment to us, but, you know, we're persistent. And so uh, we were able to get a hearing recently and uh, with the House Rules Committee, and it was, there was bipartisan support. And why delegate is so important is because it will give us a seat at the table when formulating laws and policy that impact us. And because our issues mirror that of so many other tribes, there are differences too, but because for the most part they mirror, you know, we've galvanized support from Indian country all across the United States. 
I also think it would set a standard for this country to finally show Indian tribes in this country that the United States is capable of keeping its word and honoring treaty rights that occurred so long ago. Thank you. And I think one other point is probably, probably one of the more important points here. It would also give some measure of justice for those lives lost in that trail of tears where we lost a quarter of our population during that forced march. Thank you. Thank you. Fatima, a lot of what we're talking about today is, is playing the long game um, in terms of reproductive freedom. What do you see as the long strategy legally for women? So, and I want to be clear, I think there's going to be a bunch of different things that you're going to see us all test as we get to this long game of having the right and the access to abortion and reproductive freedom recognized in this country, no matter where you live, no matter what you make, no matter your identity. And, and that might look like this current constitution being interpreted differently over time. That might look like us changing our constitution. That might look like states rising up in a range of ways. Um, but I really do believe, and, it, and you know, someone yesterday, a, a young person um, who was 19 years old asked me, do you think it's going to take 50 years? And the look on her face as, as she was asking that question was sort of crushing, right? Because she's looking at the majority of her lifetime. And I, I will say this now, if I'm wrong, you can all come back and, and, and find me. I don't think it will take 50 years. I don't think it will take 50 years, but I do think it's not one cycle. It's not one political year where everyone is energized and then goes back to their usual ways of, of doing business. So the most important thing that we in this room can do is recommit ourselves to a fight. Whatever group of room there was in 1973, where people got together and decided that for the rest of my time, I'm going to ensure that I can control women's lives and futures, that's this room today. For the rest of our time, this is a part of our work. And, and I also just want to say one last thing about the law and our courts. Um, because I don't want to give the misimpression because of my deep worry that I have given up on it. I have not given up on courts as an idea. I have not given up on our democracy. But I have, I, I am more clear I, around it. And I think that is going to be a part of putting ourselves in a position where either our existing laws are interpreted accurately or where we have the power that we need to actually change the foundation of how we are treated. And I believe it can be better than uh, the very low bar we had before June 24th, 2022. Maria, um, your organization has registered 1.25 million voters in the course of its existence. And you shared some of the innovative things you've done, even with small influencers. Are there any other strategies you've taken, something that maybe we haven't seen before that would work in some of these places where we're still so low? So we have concentrated those efforts in those eight battleground states that I shared with you. And one of it is really, we have to meet voters where they are. It is tragic that only eight out of our 50 states require civic ed education for a year to graduate from high school. It's tragic. And so one of the innovative things is like actually, how do we start moving these legislations forward so that kids could actually consume our democracy so that they understand when something is amiss? Uh, one of the things that we did develop in 2018 that we weren't able to fully deploy in 2020 because of the pandemic was this app called VoterPal. 
And VoterPal allows you to register your friends and family. So you could be 17 years old and you can register your voters. Uh, we actually did it with Mark Elias's team so that it, with the intention of circumventing Texas in particular. <laughs> because in Texas, you have to be deputized in your county in order to register a voter. Otherwise, you could actually face criminal action. And so with, yes, what? <laughs> All of this is designed to prevent us from participation. And so we basically tried to outsmart them and it's on the app store. Apple actually has named it one of the best political apps, not once but twice, because it is so easy to use. And so we're trying to get that back into, uh, into it because once you're registered or you can't register, you could help someone else do it. Um, but overall, it's really also convenings like this, getting the word out and making sure that we are in collaboration because I do think that when you talk to the American people, I personally expected the Republican Party to break the authoritarian fascist fever. And it turned out that they were not the ones with the spine. It was the American voter who sent a clear message this past election. It was women, it was independents, it was moderates who understood that our democracy was at brink. They recognized inflation was high, but they said, we can, we can cope with that. And so what we're seeing now is how do we make sure that we continue that momentum and through, you know, through apps and all of that, that's wonderful, but it's also through conversation and clear messaging of what is happening right now in our country. Thank you. I want to ask y'all also about, you know, yes, youth turnout was amazing, but it, it was very specific where it happened. Places where same-day registration occurred, um, particularly for college-aged students who have a very hard system in some states, including Arkansas, to be able to vote. Um, how do we target specifically young women that are in some form of higher education, some institution of higher education, who then might become kind of our future leaders in terms of getting them to politically participate. You know, at Cherokee Nation, I run the Cherokee Vote Project. You know, Cherokee Nation is the largest uh, federally recognized Indian tribe in the country. We have 441,000 tribal citizens. Arkansas has, has one of the highest rates of uh, citizens outside of Oklahoma. And we have voter registration drives. We travel about 24 times a year to our at-large citizens and we register them. We register them not only for the Cherokee Nation elections, but also for the state in which they live, those elections and federal elections. And we started doing this about a decade ago. And we, we've, we're well into the thousands of, uh, I think near 20,000 20, now, of who we've registered. Uh, people who would not otherwise have registered to vote. And we try to get information. We have a website out. We try to um, we go to colleges. We go to wherever we can to get young people registered, to get elders registered, and to uh, make sure that they are informed about those elections. I think it's a, it's a pretty good template for, uh, for women, for any constituency who's trying to target them to get them to the to the to the polls, you know, information is power. We will make sure everybody knows uh, the best we can, where to go, when to go, providing transportation and whatever other services are needed to get them to the polls on the day of the vote. You know, but, so young people in this country are having to vote and fight for challenges and problems that they feel like they didn't cause and they didn't, right? So that it is a, it is a tough thing for them to have to do what folks have described to me as some of these look back fights. And now on their shoulders are not only things like climate and gun safety, it is securing reproductive freedom and our very democracy, right? Like that is a lot to put on, on young people. And what I will say is I have been inspired by the sort of, okay, fine, I'm just going to do it <laughs> approach. Um, not only in this election, but the way in which they're organizing. And I think they are modeling for all of us a way to organize across issue and a way to do it that puts uh, those whose identities and experiences are most on the margins at the center. 
That is very difficult to do. They are doing it and we should follow their lead on how to run a general campaign that doesn't make black women feel like you're on the side, that doesn't leave queer people out. And so I'm, I am less worried about uh, young people. I am worried sometimes about our ability to create the conditions uh, that inspire them to keep going. Well, I think for young people, they need to see results. And what we, I always, you know, I always say that they voted in 2020 and we now have receipts to show them that their vote worked. We elected a body that passed gun legislation that lowered the cost of insulin. We actually passed the largest climate package in American history and in the world order. And that is what mobilizes them. We are passing, we're about to codify gay marriage. We're about to look at student loans. And what they're looking for now is to codify abortion rights because they want agency over themselves. And I do have to ask ourselves, you know, in this room, how are we ancestoring? Because sometimes we think of our ancestors of those past, but we're ancestoring for the children right now in schools. My daughter, our children, eight years old, my daughter is 10 years old and hers is 11. They are at the forefront of majority minority country. They are the alpha generation. They are here and they are going to be angry if they live in a world that has become a mythology of what America used to be and they don't actually get to reap what was promised. I wanted to, I'm throwing something out there that we did not discuss, but I wanted to hear more. I was so inspired by Jacqueline Corrin. Um, and I think about a lot because it's what I hear from students and from my own daughter is just the terror over the guns. How do we center that in the get out the vote efforts? It's so critical to them. Does anyone want to start? Well, I, I actually thought that um, Reshma's closing response to Jacqueline is what we're hearing a lot. In the same year, you had uh, people who were fighting for their ability to control their own bodies. You had a giant worry about bringing and dropping off our babies to school right? Our, our 11-year-olds, our, my 14-year-old. Um, and there was no ability to move and pass a care in, infrastructure. There is a conversation that's a motherhood and what it means to parent in this country right now uh, that moves across not just one issue and has us thinking about the future of those babies that we're raising, and so I actually think it's in our deep interest not to silo this issue and to actually situate it in people's lives. I, you know, when I thought about Virginia and what happened in that election last year, there was this conversation about schools that um, folk that, you know, you had one of the conversations acting as if that the, the worry was uh, critical race theory and um, the ability to support trans folks. But I wondered what would have happened if we had had a peak conversation that responded to the concerns of parents in this country. It's concerns around safety, concerns around our future, concerns around our ability to do what most women do, which is work and care. So I, I think there's an opportunity here to have a clear and forceful agenda that responds to the concerns of parents. No, I, I mean, I think there's a timidity among the elders to be bold. And what young people are demanding is exactly that, if not more. I have spent some time with uh, a family from the Uvalde. I was there right shortly after it happened. And there's a young woman, her name is Jasmine, and her, her sister was uh, one of the young girls, nine years old, a week shy of her 10th birthday, um, that was killed. And this young woman is 17 years old and she is mobilizing Uvalde despite the forces. And we did a lot of research on this. And one of the things that we found in ruby red states in the Latino community, 
what are the issues that they care about? The economy was number one, abortion was number two, guns was number three, in ruby red. And what was particularly of interest, though, is when you start talking to these families, is that they are gun owners themselves, but they want sensible legislation to protect them. And that is where the young people are demanding. And that's why the work that March for Our Lives does is astounding because they are asking us to look in the mirror and saying, where, where do we go next? I think in addition to uh, what was just said, that it's important that the young people continue to see themselves reflected in those who are the candidates and who are winning these races and who are trying to tackle these issues. You know, for the first time in my lifetime, we have six Native Americans in Congress. And so we have, it gets better. <laughs> it gets better. We also have a Native American who's a cabinet level, you know, position. First time ever. We have a Native American who is the U.S. Treasurer of the United States, also awesome. It's, it's, and we have three federal justices, all women who are Native American. That circumstance didn't exist when I was a young lady who my sole role modeling came from my family and Chief Mankiller. And so today we finally see um, at the highest level of government, Natives achieving at the highest level of government and that it's telling natives who are, at least people in our community, who are young, who are experiencing all of these issues, um, that they still must march forward. There are still ways to address these and we just don't give up. And the best message I think that can be sent to them is when they see themselves reflected in these powerful positions. Thank you. We are going to cut to a question from a student. Um, this question is from students from Little Rock Central High School right here. Um, and I think that we have a video that will cue that question. And if not, I will. Hello, Women's Voices Summit. We are the Little Rock Central High School Tigers. In our fast paced world, 16 year olds are trusted to drive in dangerous vehicles and get a job and pay taxes. We think 16 year olds should have the right to vote and express their political opinions. Do you believe this is a worthy cause to fight for? Thanks for the opportunity. So they're asking all of you, do you think 16 year olds who are trusted to drive, get a job, they pay taxes, should they have the right to vote? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I think that this generation that yes, has gone through right. so much and is <laughs> fighting for their lives and the lives of the planet, you know, and they're a lot more educated than some other voters. I see some of the smartest kids I know at that age. Well, we all want to leave each of you with a call to action. So if you're one of the note takers out there, or you're thinking, what can I do when I leave this? Um, this amazing experience we're all having. And take an action step each day. You know, we each have one. Um, and I'm gonna start and then we'll go down the line. So, and this is particularly aimed at Young women, women that move a lot in their 20s, relocate a lot, change apartments and addresses. Make sure that your voice is counted in every primary, general, and special election. Don't miss any. Make a recurring appointment in your calendar every January. Just pick a date every January where you check your voter registration, you, that you transfer it if you've moved to a new location or that you register a new in a new city. Every January, make a date with yourself. You know you're gonna find a hair appointment person. You know you're gonna register your vehicle. You know you're gonna do all those things. You're gonna make doctor's appointments for your kids, all those. Do this for you and for all of us. Awesome. My call to action relates to Cherokee Nation's delegate to Congress. We've already had a hearing in the House Rules Committee. All that's necessary now is a vote. The Senate doesn't have to vote because that treaty was signed um, was ratified by the Senate and signed by the President of the United States. We're hoping to get a vote this year. 
So if you want to learn more about the Cherokee Nation's delegate and our effort to seat the delegate, and if you believe that the United States should keep its its treaty rights and its promises that it made to us so long ago, then I urge you to go to CherokeeDelegate.com and to write your member of Congress. Madal. So I have two sisters and growing up, my mother had a rule that you always had to take your sister with you <laughs> whenever you left the house, which I hated and now appreciate deeply. Uh, and, and so that is my general call and the specific way I'm gonna ask you do it, to do it is to go to the National Women's Law Center, join us, nwlc.org. And, and there you can find out how to fight for workplace justice, for educational equity, for reproductive freedom and more. So thank you. Uh, this has been an incredible opportunity. And I want to, one of the things that I would say the call to action is, is that many Americans don't realize that there's 16 million Americans who live in mixed status families, meaning that someone in their life, in their household is undocumented, 16 million. Those 16 million are disproportionately young people. One of the things that we're pushing right now in Congress is to provide that young person, that that person can sleep better at night because their brother or their cousin is safe because DACA has been codified. And so I encourage you all to go to votolatino.org to find more about the, what we're doing right now, but it's a coalition led by the Immigration Hub and it has some of the fiercest leadership there. Many who cannot vote but that have been able to mobilize our country to recognize that we should not be ungrateful for their contributions. We all benefit from the work these amazing women do, so let's thank them.